Hello friends, it's Cassandra. Welcome to episode two of Theology Basics or Christian Basics. Uh, so today, before we get started talking about the Trinity, I think it'll be helpful to actually talk about who the Trinity isn't. Because as we start discussing who the Trinity is, you're bound in trying to understand it and make sense of it all in your head to limit who God is. And in doing so, you're probably gonna fall into one of these heresy categories. Not because you're a heretic and not because you're not smart enough to figure out who God is, but because God is way beyond our understanding and if and in our desire to understand him, it's just in our nature to accidentally limit him. So I'm going to talk through a few different heresies today and hopefully you can keep those in mind in next week's video as we talk about who he actually is so that as you understand and work through the Trinity, you don't fall into one of these three heresies. So if you grew up in the church or possibly if you didn't, you were probably told about the Trinity in, with some sort of analogy. This could look like an egg, or a shamrock, or um, the states of water. Basically, you're told that God is like this one thing that has three parts to it. It might have looked something like this. Hello kids, today we're going to talk about the Trinity. Now, can anyone tell me what I have here in my hand? That's right, an egg. We would all agree that we can look at this and say, I'm holding one egg. But if we look a little closer, we'll notice that this one egg actually is made of three things. If I crack this egg open, we can see the three parts of the egg a little bit better. So here, we have the egg shell, we have the egg yolk, and we have the egg white. So, just like in one egg, we have the egg shell, the egg yolk, and the egg whites, when we think about God, we know that He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one. And that's the Trinity. Yeah, that's heresy. <laughs> the egg and the shamrock analogy communicate a heresy called partialism. So the idea of partialism is that there is one God and the Trinity is the three parts of God, hence partialism. The Holy Spirit is a third of God, Jesus, the Son, is a third of God, and the Father is a third of God. Or maybe you have some sort of weird partialism where they're not equal parts, but that's a whole nother issue of itself. Basically, each person of the Trinity is a part of who God is. The issue with this is that if you take one of these parts of God now and look at them separately, they're not wholly God on their own. You require all three parts to be put together in order for God to be God. And this almost starts to look like some form of another heresy, which is tritheism. So tritheism says that there are three people, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they come together in basically a council, and they say, we are God. The name of our band is God, and we are the three members of it, <laughs> basically. It's, it's a lot more like a Mount Olympus type situation than anything Christian. Now the water analogy, saying that God is like H2O in the sense that it can be ice or water or a vapor, is uh, modalism. So in that idea, it says that God can act as the Father, or act as the Son, or act as the Holy Spirit. There are more modes or functions of who God is as opposed to persons. Water, or God, according to this way of thinking, can't be a solid and a liquid and a gas all at the same time. It, it has to choose. It, it can only be one at a time. 
And so it, this would say that God can only be the Father at one time. He can't be the Son at the same time. He can't be the Holy Spirit at the same time as one another. It's, it's one thing at a time. A lot of people get this idea by looking at the way that God reveals himself progressively throughout the Bible. They think God was the Father in the Old Testament, he was the Son during the Gospels, and he is the Spirit in the New Testament to current life. And that's just not true. In order to truly believe any of these three heresies, you have to discount what the Bible says about who God is. So as I said, modalism is a heresy because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit exist alongside each other. They always have, they always will. They've always existed at the same time. The two main passages in the Bible that show this is that of Genesis 1 and Jesus' baptism. Let's take a look. So if you want to read along with me, I'm in Genesis 1-1. So the very beginning, from the first point of scripture, God is revealed to us as a trinity. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, if we go to John, we get a little bit of an interpretation of this. So John 1, verse 1. So John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So God makes, in, the, in Genesis 1, God makes the world through his word. This is confirmed for us in John chapter 1, when it says the word was with God, the word was God, with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. So God made through the word. Then turning back to Genesis, the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So here God is understood to be the father. The word of God is the son, and then the spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. So we see all three of these present at the same time, acting at the same time in these passages. We also see the Trinity working together, present at the same time in Jesus' baptism. I'm going to read the account that's in Matthew chapter 3. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So Jesus is the Son. That's confirmed here. The Spirit of God, again the Holy Spirit, descends like a dove. And the voice from heaven is the Father. And we know this because he calls him my Son. And the if he's his son, then he has to be the father. <laughs> All right, we know that tritheism is not true because of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This was super, super popular among Jews to say this prayer, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So we know God is one God. He would not reveal himself to us this way if this was not the case. Because of the character of God, we know he wouldn't lie to us. And we'll get to the character of God in a few weeks. But God said he is one, and so he is one. All right, and then we know that partialism is not the case because of the words of Jesus. Now, I would suggest reading the entire three chapters of this to get a full understanding. It's in John. So John 14 through 17, really, is fantastic Trinitarian theology. Like, I... We're gonna talk a lot about these chapters next week. It's all the words of Jesus. He is teaching the disciples about who God is, and there's so much Trinitarian talk because that's who God is. So right now we're going to focus in on ver chapter 16, verse 14 and 15, and hopefully you'll get a taste of what is all in there. So Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. He says, He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. 
All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Now, this might sound like a stretch just based on those verses, but if you read the full context, you'll see that this is what's being said. I'm not going to read all of them for the sake of time and because I think you would get bored. But what's being said here is that everything that the Father has, the Son has, and so therefore everything that the Son has, the Spirit has. So they all have these same things. They're united. So they're all holy God because they're all sharing the same things that make God God. It's not like the the part of the Father brings this aspect to the table and the part of the Son brings this to the table. It, they all have the same things that they're bringing to the table. <laughs> and so it doesn't make sense for us to say they're parts because they're all exactly the same and they're united as one. We're going to be talking a lot more about this aspect of the unity of the Trinity next week, so just hold on. If you have a specific question, go ahead and put it in the comments, but we'll probably get to it at least partially next week. So those are some of the most basic misunderstandings of the Trinity and why we know they're incorrect. Next week, we'll be talking about who the Trinity is and how we know that. Again, read John chapters 13 through 17 or 14 through 17 if you can between now and then. I also still highly suggest reading um, this book, Delighting in the Trinity by Michael Reeves. It's a fantastic book that walks you through scripture if you're not sure where to start in understanding the Trinity and how that's revealed to us in scripture. But until then, remember you are loved, and I will see you next week. Bye. I did not plan for this bowl to match this table so well. I am just highly skilled or unskilled. It depends on how you interpret that match. And then if I crack this egg open, oh my gosh, I'm afraid to open this egg. Guys, it's not cracking. I cracked it. Okay, that was really creepy. <laughs> okay, this is really fun though. It's like a forbidden stress ball. <laughs>